And the room is very full. That's, uh, we're very glad to be here. Um, my name is uh, Emily. Yes, and my colleague is uh, Fredrik. We only have one mic, so we're going to switch in the middle, sort of. Uh, but let's get started. Uh, I have uh, an agenda here, and at the beginning we see I planned to walk through the definition of a pipeline, but considering the audience, I think that's unnecessary. Uh, so I'm going to skip that. And uh, me, I'm uh, coming from Ericsson, uh, which is... Uh, not open source, of course, it's a company, but we do contribute to open source, and uh, that's why we're here today. Uh, I'd like to start off with describing what kind of challenges we've seen uh, considering the communication uh, between different CI CD tools. And then um, I'm going to present the way we solved it. Yes, and I'm going to speak a little bit louder. Uh, and also how we open sourced our solution and uh, how Fredrik and his company Axis uh, started using the same solution. So let's skip this part uh, as promised and instead uh, go straight to the communication challenges that we've seen at Ericsson. So first of all, why does Ericsson care about CI-CD? Well, any company that produces software should care about CI-CD, obviously. Um, we have a very complex environment. We have a lot of different products going out to our customers. Um, different uh, configuration applied on top of them, considering if it's going to be to customer A or if uh, customer B wants them. So, and we have many different pipelines and different pipeline tools used uh, to produce our software. Uh, very often they're integrated into each other, they're called connected pipelines, and that's what we like to call them. And I'll uh, go, go through that, what I mean by that later. Um, we are a very large organization. We have like hundreds of teams developing our products. Each one of them use different toolings. Um, and uh, the demands on traceability is very high. Uh, we need to keep track of our software. We need to go see which stages does it go through uh, in, the, in the pipeline. No matter if it uh, stops at delivery or if it goes all the way into deployment to the customer networks. We need to follow and see where does our software go? We, know, uh, we also need to be able to monitor it, independent of whichever technology we use uh, in the background. We need to be able to keep track of the important KPIs and uh, I guess also visualize it in a good way. And one visualization tool would be nice. So I spoke about connected pipelines. And what I mean by that is we usually integrate our products into each other, sort of. So they're hierarchies of products. So you've got product A and B to the left here, and they're produced in their own separate pipelines uh, before they're together integrated into the next level of the next connected pipeline, producing the product A, B. Um, this is a very common phenomenon uh, at Ericsson, where we have multiple integration spots. And it, it's tough to keep track of all of these dependencies to integrate upstream and uh, see where does this software come from and how it has been tested before we integrate it. And again, traceability is important here all the way. So I've tried to summarize into a few questions of what are the exact challenges we see? What, are, what is the problems that we need to solve? One thing is when we use different pipeline environments, how do we communicate about when our product has been delivered or released. Let's say our product A is done here. How does somebody downstream become aware of this? How can we announce this to the world? And uh, how can we, if we have another perspective, how can we become aware when others release their software? Automatically, independent of whichever technology stack we use, it would be nice to become aware of, oh, hey, this version XYZ is now available, so we automatically integrate it into our pipeline and go for it. And how can we visualize these connections? How can we see what kind of tests has been done upstream, but also downstream on our software later on? Um, how can we see how many has downloaded our products? It would be nice to know. Were their tests successful into their environment? 
or not, and why. So, um, the solution for this was that we, we focused mostly on the communication. How can we communicate across different tools? So, we came up with a solution that's like a common language, if you will, across these different pipelines, across different tools, across different visualization tools that could be based off the same information. Uh, and we called it AFL. Now, AFL is um, uh, created in 2012, so we've been using it for a lot of years internally. A couple of years back, we open sourced it, and it's now available on GitHub. But what it is, it's a message protocol. It's event-based. It's defining a set of events that you can use to communicate about different concepts used in your pipeline, be it artifacts, be it tests, source code changes. You can communicate about this independent of whichever technology you use. Doesn't matter if it's a Java application that's uploaded somewhere to a Maven repository or if it's a Docker image you uploaded it to <coughs> Docker Hub. Um, you can still communicate about it in the same thing, in the same way. And uh, what's, uh, what I think is great about AFL, at least, it's you can cherry pick whichever events suit your needs. You don't have to take all of the protocol, it's a lot of events. You can cherry pick the ones that you specifically need in your use case. So let's say you're only interested in the test case related events, then you only ma care about those. And the events are also linked together. And that's very important for us, at least, to maintain the traceability between them. So you can trace back from the latest event, you can go backwards in time and see the whole pipeline chain can represent the pipeline. And with AFL, you can answer some of the questions I posed uh, previously. For example, when we have a new artifact available, you can send out an event saying that I've now created this artifact. You see to the left of the, in the picture, it's the called AFL artifact created event. What comes after that is, could be uh, a published event. Whenever you upload it somewhere, you can send additional events, linking back to the previously created artifact. And the linking here is important. Um, the protocol itself defines how you can link your events, if they must have or if, they, if it's optional links. Um, these are all in JSON format, in case you're wondering. Um, next question could be, how can we visualize our pipeline? It's a pipeline consists of many different steps, right? Independent of how it looks, you want to maybe tell the world about what has happened, how do we visualize this? This is a very simple uh, CI pipeline. It's a GitLab syntax, so you build uh, your product, then you test it, you test it some more, and then you upload, uh, you build binary somewhere. Um, very standard case. Um, and uh, some of the AFL events that could be used for this are, for example, these. You can have an artifact created event to signify the first build. This is where you actually build your uh, binary or whatever it might be. Uh, then you start some tests. And then you might want to send test case <coughs> events. So you've got the triggered, started, and finished events for this. And these can be sent, of course, uh, these jobs are in parallel in this pipeline. So you can send them in two sets. And then comes the artifact published event um, as the last one to signify that, hey, now my artifact is available somewhere for uh, downloading. And I'm going to show you the exact same uh, set of events, only connected in an event graph to make it clearer. So start to the left, we've got artifact created event. This is the first one in the chronological order. Then comes the test case events which links back to the artifact because this is the what, uh, what we're testing. And the link name in this case is called item under test. It makes, mm, makes perfect sense to me at least. Uh, then comes the test case started event, uh, linking back to the triggering. Uh, and then we've got the finished event, test case finished event. This one contains the result uh, of the test, if it was successful or not. Now, of course, if you have several uh, test cases, you might want to group them under some sort of label that's saying, yes, I've tested it to this extent, and I want to label my artifact now 
this is uh, ready for the next level of delivery uh, somewhere. Then you can call, uh, you can send a confidence level modified event. And this is uh, very free formatted in a way that you can name the confidence level whatever you want to, as long as you standardize it, it shouldn't be a problem. And then you point back to uh, the artifact that you've created. So this is very useful for us as listeners or consumers of this product. We know once it has been tested enough, we know when it's reached the confidence level we uh, want it to have before we actually start using it. And once the last event comes in, it's the artifact published event, we know where we can find it. Where is the artifact located? Where can I download it? And I have one last wrap up here. As I said, we, are, uh, we have open sourced this and uh, uh, it's available on GitHub. And uh, we really uh, hope that the community keeps growing and uh, getting more contributions because we see that a lot of different companies and organizations have the same problems uh, that we faced. And one thing I liked about uh, AFL is that it provides one common language across uh, different technology stacks, across different tools you might use. So you can base visualization tools on the events in this data, for example. And what's also important is the links between the events. It enables traceability so you can follow a complete set of pipeline. You know what has happened to your software and you know where it might go even further downstream. And uh, I'd like to invite Fredrik to this side of the room so we can switch mics because he's going to tell you about how Axis started contributing and using AFL. Let's see if I can set this up here. Okay, so um, so I'm from a from a company called Axis Communications, and and we do uh, surveillance cameras, which is a kind of a scary thing. But there are a lot of there's a lot of software running in these cameras, and uh, it's, somebody said roughly around 20 million lines of code in the camera. So there there is a lot of software going into it, this small thing. It's a kind of a it's basically a Linux box, but but still. And we have nowhere the scale that that Ericsson has. We have about thousand developers in total and uh, the team that that does the teams that do the the cameras are about 400 developers uh, and about 150 testers and we do we, we, we th like to think we do continuous integration at least because we commit to master uh, a lot of times every day and I'm going to try to tell you our AFL story so Emily gave you a, a good background on what AFL is and, and I'm try to to go through some kind of a timeline, how we how we found out about AFL and how we adopted it, and how we now very much would like to drive our all of our pipelines using it. That's at least that's the ambition for for the future. And first, I would like to give you some context on on what exactly it is that we do. So, so Axis is a it's quite an old company, and uh, we do, we've done. In the history, we've done network connected stuff, and and which it's, it's basically just making a, some kind of hardware, putting it in a box, and selling it. That's the standard access way that we've been doing it for for a, a lot of years, and and it's basically what other companies do also. They they sell cardboard boxes with tech stuff in it. Uh, but but more and more, we've been seeing a demand from our from our business and from our from our customers that they want complete systems they want uh, cloud integration they want uh, they want a lot of stuff which which in turn gives a lot more software that has to be tested has to work together so that that's where in there that comes the challenge of of knowing how which which versions work together which software stacks works best together and so on so that's that's kind of our the, the similar challenge that Ericsson has but back to our story. Uh, the first recorded presence of the AFL protocol at Axis. Uh, as, as I've um, heard, there were a couple of engineers attending some kind of a conference or a meeting where, where somebody from Ericsson was presenting some kind of a visualization tool, how you could visualize 
your software. I don't think it was called, I, didn't, I don't even think it was referred to as a pipeline, but, but still some kind of software flow. And, and they found out this was something called AFOL, which was underneath here. And they, were, they got intrigued, so they, they, they started doing some tinkering on their own and trying to, trying to make something with AFOL in the Axis context. And, and, and which, was, which was fine, but it really didn't lead anywhere. And then it resurfaced in some kind of a, in a research academia industry project that Axis had, where some of the researchers had found out about AFOL from Ericsson also. And, and it resurfaced, then they did some more tinkering, and some more engineers got interested, but it was still kind of under the radar stuff, just engineers, like technology enthusiasts that did stuff, but nothing that really drove the business or was a, was a thing. And in, like, the next, next big thing, uh, in my opinion, was, was when Axis actually released something that had to do with Eiffel. So these engineers had been tinkering more, and they wanted to to make something of it. They wanted to able to produce something that was of value. So, so they, they, we used Jenkins as almost everybody else. So they, they made a Jenkins plugin, which was very basic. It basically produced a artifact created event when we, we did a build. That was all we did. So it was kind of worthless on its own, but still it's kind of a footprint that, that now we're actually producing AFL events. We have a message bus where there are events coming out but uh, anyone, there, were, there was really nobody listening, which, was, which is kind of a problem. Because it's, it's, uh, when doing uh, uh, this type of thing, so you, you, the, the, the whole point is to somebody listening in and acting on the events, and there is like a chain created and a flow. So, so our biggest problem here was, was nobody was listening in, and if nobody's listening in a pub sub culture, it's kind of hard to know if you're making sense, if, if, you, if you, in the beginning at least. Because you have to know that, that in the beginning you have to have some kind of acknowledgement that your event was, you, it was useful. There's a value to it. So we had to, to create some kind of value in our minimal AFL implementation. And this is basically where I, where I came in in the, in the AFL thing. I, I was a part of a team that does test automation. And we were struggling with our CI part, or the testing part of our CI pipeline. It was uh, kind of old, and we didn't, it didn't really want to do what we wanted to do with our testing. So we, we, we started looking to uh, rebuilding it, basically, or, or changing it, and so on. And I had a coffee discussion with a colleague of mine. He, he was one of those uh, AFL tinkering engineers. So he said, you should, you should look at AFL if you're going to do things from scratch. Uh, you might as well look at AFL because it's pretty cool. You can do cool stuff with it. And we looked into AFL, and, and we, a colleague, me and a colleague, and we really liked it. We 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 saw that this was this was something that could that could probably not solve our immediate problems, but the, there was a bigger issue of of the system of systems talk and and knowing uh, information about the software that goes in from from everywhere. So so we decided to make our new testing part of the CI CD pipeline uh, talk AFL and understand AFL. And in this, we started listening to the Jenkins events, the lonely guy over here that was playing AFL music and nobody was listening. So we actually started listening to that. And we started triggering our tests based on those, those events, uh, which, which gave us uh, a much more better understanding of what it is like to have an event-driven pipeline and what, we, what it was like to adhere to a protocol like AFL. And, and we actually wound up being a, a great listener to the AFL protocol. And during, during the development of our, our testing pipeline, uh, we, we had to learn AFL, basically. So we, we, we wrote a bunch of uh, Python libraries, uh, and two of them, which were kind of important, uh, at least we thought, we, 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 we said we, we, had to, we have to con contribute back to, since it was an open source, if it was an open source uh, community and an open source protocol, we said we, we can cont contribute here. We can learn people how to teach people how to, how to uh, use AFL. Uh, and these two libraries, the AFL Python lib, which is a kind of a small library that lets you publish uh, AFL messages and listen to AFL messages uh, on the message bus. Uh, it's, it's, 
very useful if you want to get started with AFL. And then there's something called uh, uh, AFL GraphQL API, which is basically an API on top of the, the, um, the event repository, which is basically a storage for events, because if you want to look at events back in history, you have to store them somewhere. You can't just keep them on the bus. So that's basically our, our GraphQL, which is kind of useful if you want, if you want to start tinkering with, with the storing events and looking back in history and so on. Um, and this, this open sourcing of this got uh, uh, access more engaged in the community. And we actually, there's a, there's a conference called, uh, called AFL Summit. Uh, it's a very small conference, but we actually, Access actually hosted it um, uh, this fall. Uh, and uh, in, in moving forward, we're going to try to, to keep the backlogs working with an open backlog concept. As, as we learn about AFL, how we are, our, our journey, we'll try to contribute directly to the, to the community rather than just doing stuff inside and then just dumping it outside, which is kind of a bad thing. And then moving forward, um, as AFL is now a, a thing at Axis, we actually have a small team that work with AFL, and we're we're going to have really going to try to to drive all the, all of our pipelines. Uh, uh, we see them being event driven in some way, uh, moving forward, and also also we're going to try to to contribute more to the AFL community, trying to to like Emily said, we want to spread it, want to. Uh, make more people try it out and, and see if it, it can become a thing. Um, so we'll try to, to contribute more of our experiences uh, moving forward in 2020. And that's, that's, that's my Axis AFL journey, basically. And we'd like to thank you for listening to us. And here is some, some contact information, uh, the AFL community on GitHub. And we have a Google group and a Slack channel and a YouTube channel also with some, some videos if you want to learn more or get a more basic uh, tutorial of, of what AFL is. And now I guess it's questions. <laughs> So the question was, is there some kind of a, a GitLab integration for, for, for AFL? Yeah. Uh, not that I know of currently on, on <coughs> GitHub. I don't know if, no, not, not yet. Uh, so, and I'm, I'm not quite sure how GitLab works. So, uh, so uh, I, I w but it should be possible. There's no, I, I don't see any like big technical uh, blocking it. It's just that somebody has to, to contribute it and do it. But so it's say, let's say I want to use that and I want to use it with GitLab because we don't use Jenkins. Yeah. How would, is there any, like, is there in the GitHub any kind of stuff how to do it within my, like, manually, like, triggering events? There are some, if, if you look at the, the Python library, uh, there, is some, there is some basic, basic, tutorial on how to set that up, how to send events and, and uh, receive events. And then there's also, also something called, I think it's called AFL easy to use, or, mm -hmm. which is basically a set of Docker containers that you could just uh, spin up and you get a full, uh, like a small pipeline which produces events. But I don't, it's, it's, that's something that Ericsson contributed. I don't know if all of it is open source yet. Might be, but it's basically something you can try out. To, to get some messages going and, and try to get a feel for how it how it works. <coughs> yep. Question for Emily uh, with Ericsson. You've been using IFO for several years now. If you might be sitting on a lot of valuable data regarding your um, flow of information of artifacts and if you would like to for example reduce lead time uh, data and increase where it also makes more. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so the question was, uh, since we've been sending events for several years now within Ericsson, uh, 
uh, we have, of course, a lot of data uh, accumulated. So we, the question was if we can look at lead times and see where are the bottlenecks in the pipelines. And yes, of course, we do have that possibility. And that's one of the great benefits that we've seen internally, at least. And that's why I think, I don't know how many millions of events we have stored, but there's a lot of them. Uh, so it's indeed possible if you have like a implementation of a storage somewhere and then you can look it up and you can see uh, because all the events are timestamped so you can also see lead times between the events between different activities in your pipeline which is very useful and uh, yes Fredrik mentioned I'd just like to add because aside from the protocol we have some um, example implementations of services surrounding the protocol helping to send the events helping to visualize them i think we also have open sourced and there are more coming the more planned uh, for that it's just a matter of prioritization and so on <laughs> any more questions yes in the back So the question was, have we tried to use Eiffel outside of development to trigger some manual activities, if I understood it correctly? And not, I'm not aware that we listen and act upon uh, these events and then doing some sort of manual step. Of course, it, it's at all possible, but the listeners usually are uh, performing some sort of automatic task afterwards. And as far as I know, we mostly focus on up until continuous delivery, sort of. Deployment uh, stages don't really trigger on AFL events uh, later on, uh, yet, uh, at least. I can add something to that. So, so there, are, there are like more generic AFL events, uh, like announcement events that say, say something, that something has happened. And, and you could definitely use that for... for for signaling other people in the organization. And we actually use that to uh, sort of a debugging thing that we, so we know that we've gone a certain path through our, our testing CI system. We do announcements here and there to see, okay, we've gone this far because it's, it's a microservice architecture and it's, it's kind of hard to keep track of everything. So, so it's, it's a handy thing, but there are announcements events that are very generic, so you could use them for, for almost anything. Any more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.